We want them to grow up stronger. Good morning, America. New overnight scorched earth. The death toll from Northern California's massive wildfire jumping overnight, more than a thousand missing. President Trump visiting today, people there grabbing face masks. It's just been chaos. And many people who lost homes and fled to tent cities now being told to pack up and go. Ordered hit, the CIA reportedly concluding that Saudi's crown prince ordered the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, contradicting the kingdom's claims. Will President Trump take action? Saved, a man looking at life in prison. That's what I'm scared of most, just going to prison for no reason. How his mother and a selfie proved his innocence. Caught on camera, look at this, school bus chaos. All of these kids, can you jump out the window to me? A bus filled with screaming children, the driver pulling over, why she refused to get behind the wheel and what parents are saying this morning. And how great thou art. Oh, Lord, my God. We'll tell you what Elvis Presley, the Sultan of Swat, and the late Justice Antonin Scalia have in common. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Good morning, a lot to get to, so let's get right to our top story. Today, President Trump is making his first visit to the disaster zone in California. He's leaving this morning. While there, he will witness firsthand the devastation from the deadliest wildfire in America in a century. This as the number of missing people has just skyrocketed to more than 1,000. The death toll currently stands at 71. And here's a sign of the times. Californians now taking to social media with face mask selfies, protecting themselves from air pollution now ranked among the worst in the world with smoke so thick it has prompted health warnings and school closings. Now the president will also arrive at a time when he has freshly stirred resentments among the people on the ground there with new comments about who's to blame for these fires. ABC's Marcus Moore is in Malibu. Marcus, good morning. Well, Whit, good morning to you. The, the destruction here is absolutely unimaginable. Only a couple of walls are standing where a house used to be, and you can see the rest is pure rubble. And this is a scene being repeated in various parts of this state. And this morning, those new numbers are revealing the scale of this disaster. Overnight, the death toll from Northern California's horrifying campfire rising to 71, with authorities still trying to locate as many as 1,000 people and over 12,000 structures destroyed. Thick smoke from the fire seen here from space, reaching over 100 miles to San Francisco, forcing residents to wear face masks, canceling flights, and closing schools. The air quality in San Francisco yesterday, reportedly the worst of any major city in the country. California's scorched earth and thick smoke the backdrop for President Trump's planned visit later today. The big problem we have is management. You need forest management. It has to be. I'm not saying that in a negative way, a positive. I'm just saying the facts. California's governor, Jerry Brown, and governor-elect Gavin Newsom still open to working with the president. For locals, many who lost everything, emotions from that criticism are still running high. We don't need him here. He could just tweet something nice, three words, I am sorry. I'm happy he's coming, and I think it'll add some brightness to a lot of people. The community of paradise in Northern California, one of the hardest hit, burned to the ground. Many of those lucky enough to get out ending up here, homeless in a tent city next to a Walmart parking lot. It's just been chaos. I mean, I got here the first day, and there was hardly anybody here. And then it's just more and more and more and more and more. Donations flooding in to help buoy those fleeing the fire, but the tent city apparently not permitted to last past this weekend. Now the Red Cross and local county authorities reportedly working together to help occupants move to shelters later today. And it's unclear where all of those people will go because some with pets were reluctant to go to shelters. And one of the reasons that tent city is being shut down is because rain is expected. And that brings up the next concern with so much scorched earth Many are worried about mudslides. Guys? 
insult to injury in this multifaceted uh, disaster. Marcus Moore from the ground there, we really appreciate it. Uh, let's hone in on one of the areas of difficulty. As we said, the smoke from the fires doing a number on air quality. Rob is here with more on that. Rob, good morning, sir. Good morning, Dan. You know, some conversions of the air quality to what it's like if you smoke cigarettes in San Francisco at one point this week, it was so bad, it was like smoking 11 cigarettes in one day. And the smoke is heavy. You saw it in some of that video there. And it's heavy across, especially some parts of the valleys. And we still have the fires burning in Malibu. And of course, the one in, in Paradise there, or just the east of Paradise. And now, besides the air quality, we have a red flag warning that's been posted that includes uh, Paradise and some of the foothills of the Sierras there for low levels of humidity and some gusty winds. This isn't quite a strong Santa Ana event, but it is, can, continues to be dry, at least for now. And uh, as Marcus mentioned, we do have a changing weather pattern for the better and that will get more of an offshore flow beginning or onshore flow beginning Tuesday and Wednesday with a little bit of troughiness here with some rain coming into Northern California, some rain coming into Southern California. And yes, this uh, could be a double edged sword. We desperately need the rain. We don't need it all at one time. That could bring some mudslides, but any moisture at this point is welcome. More on that uh, throughout the program. Eva? Yeah, we were there and our whole crew was having trouble breathing. We're all wearing the face masks the whole time. Yeah, hours away from the actual fire itself. Incredible. Well, yeah, it, it, Sacramento, San Francisco, yeah. all struggling with that air. Right, thanks, guys. Damaging new claims emerging this morning about the death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The CIA reportedly coming to the conclusion that the Saudi crown prince ordered the Washington Post columnist's murder. ABC's senior foreign correspondent Ian Panel has the latest from our London bureau. Ian, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Dan and Eva. After weeks of speculation and denial, the CIA has now concluded the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, did order the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, according to the Washington Post this morning. The writer who worked for the paper was murdered last month after he entered the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. He was there seeking papers to marry his Turkish fiancée. Now, according to the Post, the CIA investigated multiple sources of information, including communications by the the royal family that indicated Hashogji had been told to go to the Saudi consulate in Istanbul to collect that paperwork. A senior Turkish official has told ABC News that audio recordings show that within minutes of arriving there, Hashogji was killed. For their part, the Saudis have strongly denied the allegation the Crown Prince ordered the killing. And Ian, it would seem that this would put more pressure on President Trump to respond here. Yeah, I think undoubtedly. I mean, to date, the president has avoided blaming the prince, instead stressing the importance of the relationship and America's reliance on lucrative arms contracts. And of course, we know energy supplies are also a factor. But the president has demanded answers, calling the incident a terrible thing, saying he's now working with Congress to form a much stronger opinion. Dan, Eva? All right, Ian Panel in London, thank you. Now to the latest in the Russia investigation. President Trump saying he's written responses to a series of questions submitted by the special counsel, Robert Mueller. So let's go to ABC News White House correspondent Tara Palmieri, who has more on what the president is saying about his answers and about the special counsel. Tara, good morning. Good morning, Dan and Eva. This may be the first sign the special counsel's investigation may be wrapping up. But just because the president is ready to re submit his responses doesn't mean he's done answering to Robert Mueller. Overnight, the president finally answering those questions from special counsel Robert Mueller, claiming that he alone responded without the help of his lawyers. My lawyers don't write answers. I write answers. Uh, I was asked a series of questions. I've answered them very easily, very easily. At the same time, the president, without evidence, suggesting the special counsel wants to catch him in a perjury trap. You have to always be careful when you answer questions with people that probably have bad intentions. His lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, previously raising concerns that President Trump could be accused of lying under oath. What is the danger in answering Robert Because they're trying to trap... They're, they're, you, can't, you couldn't put a lawyer on the show who wants to keep his law license to tell you he should testify. The president has yet to submit his answers, saying he still needs his lawyers to review them. You need lawyers for submittal. You need lawyers to go over some of the answers. But they're not very difficult questions. Sources tell ABC News that the president has been working with his legal team for days to complete the questions. During that time, his irritation with the investigation unleashed in a series of tweets. The president crying foul, saying, quote, the inner workings of the Mueller investigation are a total mess. They are a disgrace to our nation and don't care how many lives they ruin. You on Twitter yesterday, uh, CBS, 
bit agitated about what you might be receiving the Mueller investigation. No, I'm not agitated. It's a I'm hoax. Curious. The whole thing is a hoax. There was no collusion. The president has long said that he wanted to sit down face to face with Robert Mueller and answer his questions, and that it was his lawyers that were advising him against it. But that was long before he ever saw the questions. Dan? Tara, thank you. A lot to talk about here, so let's bring in ABC News chief political analyst Matthew Dowd. Matt, good morning to you. Uh, the president says the special counsel probably has bad intentions, those were his words, uh, and his lawyer Rudy Giuliani says he may be setting up a perjury trap here. Do you think those are valid concerns? Well, as my mom used to say, if you tell the truth, you don't need to have a good memory. If you tell the truth, you don't need to worry about a perjury trap. I, I, I think the special counsel is not interested in capturing the capturing the president in a perjury trap. I think he's much more interested in was there obstruction of justice and there was there some conspiracy to coordinate or collude in this election by the Russians in, in concert with Americans. So I think that is not necessarily the major concern of, or shouldn't be the major concern of the president. I think actually what is substantively going on inside the Mueller investigation, which Dan, as you know, none of us fully know. It's been most, um, it's almost been completely leak proof. It is a black box, and we, at some point, uh, presumably, we will know. Let me ask you about another headline this morning. As we reported a few moments ago, the CIA now says it has confidence that the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi was, in fact, ordered by the Saudi crown prince. He's a close ally of the White House. A wit asked Ian Panel about this. Do you think uh, this news is going to force the president to take tougher action against the crown prince? Well, that's a uh, really open question, and I don't know the answer to that. As you recall, remember when all of the things came out about the Russians interfering in the election, and Donald Trump continued to say he didn't know if it was, he didn't know if he'd believe it, he did that Putin had told him that he wasn't involved in it. So I don't know if Donald Trump will take that tact. He would be better off, much be better off, in saying, I have the intelligence, we have the information, we're now assured that the crown prince was involved in this, and he should therefore take some, ac some, some action, some forceful action, not only because of that, but also because of what's going on in the humanitarian crisis in Yemen and the civil war that the Saudis are backing and that we're selling weapons to. I think the president ought to step forward, but his history shows that he's willing to forgive the people that are his friends. Uh, finally, I, I want to ask you about uh, an interesting article in the New York Times this morning. It says the president has been asking many people in his orbit whether Vice President Mike Pence is loyal. Uh, many onlookers would, would say that Vice President Pence has been extremely loyal. So what's going on here? It's interesting that, that the Vice President gets tons of criticism for being over, overly obsequious with the President and constantly saying the President's great and constantly saying the President's wonderful, he's the greatest President that we've had. But he gets this from the President. The President puts a premium on loyalty, and I think he questions it in everybody except his family. So do you think this is a sign that Pence could be off the ticket? No, I think that would be a grave mistake. I think the President always raises these questions and does it, I think, to pressure Mike Pence to continue to be loyal. Matt Dow, we always appreciate your analysis on a Saturday morning. Thank you very much, sir. Well, now to a family terrorized in their own home. They never expected a man to come barging in during a snowstorm. ABC's Ariel Reshef joins us with more on the calls the family made to police. Good morning, Ariel. Good morning to you, Eva. That bizarre encounter started when authorities say the suspect suddenly burst into that home late at night, wielding a knife. The children making that chilling call to 911 as they pleaded for their lives. Terrifying moments for a mother and her three children after authorities say a man broke into their home with a knife. Did you say he had a knife, ma'am? <laughs> what? Does he have a knife or a weapon? I don't know. Police outside Boston say the family was watching TV around 11 o'clock at night when it happened. The family desperately calling 911 as they were threatened by the intruder. Yes, you can be told. Okay. According to officials, the suspect, identified as 39-year-old Ricardo Francis, slid off the roadway during a snowstorm, crashing his car into a vehicle parked at the end of the family's driveway. Francis then allegedly wielding a knife, breaking into the home, assaulting the mother with a picture frame, the children pleading for their lives. An officer showing up within seconds, subduing Francis at gunpoint, taking him into custody. He was just screaming and... I just grew down on him and held him held there until he complied. 
a hero officer there, and no one in the family sustained any life-threatening injuries. Francis is charged with armed home invasion and multiple felonies. Police say that there, that bizarre encounter, uh, there was no connection between the family and the suspect. So it's just strange, a random crime. It's terrifying. Just, yeah, yeah, terrifying, and those children really what wherewithal to call 911 yeah, in the middle up. of it. Yeah. And a storm could delay emergency services as well. Yep. So, all right, Ariel Resha, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Now to that GoFundMe campaign for a homeless veteran that prosecutors say turned out to be a scam. The attorney now for the woman who claimed she was rescued after running out of gas is now telling her side of the story. This morning, a shocking new twist in the inspiring story of a homeless veteran that authorities say was a total lie. The attorney for one of the accused scammers now claiming that she too is a victim. All along, Kate is being used and being set up to continue to be the face of this. The lawyer representing Kate McClure says it was her boyfriend at the time, Mark D'Amico and Johnny Bobbitt, who met first and pushed the alleged scheme, launching a GoFundMe page with a staged photo and a heartwarming tale. The couple saying Bobbitt offered Kate his last $20 when she ran out of gas. But prosecutors say McClure even admitted the story was fake when texting a friend, writing, OK, so wait, the gas part is completely made up, but the guy isn't. I had to make something up to make people feel bad. What that meant is that he really was a homeless veteran, and she was trying to help him. Their campaign raising more than $400,000, but prosecutors say McClure and D'Amico spent most of it in just months on extravagant trips, shopping sprees, and a BMW, all while the story made headlines. It's like winning the lottery. Then, in late summer, reports of the trio fighting with each other over money went public, the couple telling their side of the story on national TV. It's so hard to deal with when we know that we did a good thing, and I still believe that we did a good thing, and I would do it all over again. Authorities say that dispute began to unravel their web of lies. Kate had no idea that there had been a agreement, a conspiracy, really, between D'Amico and Bobbitt to get money through GoFundMe. Now, McClure's attorney says she and D'Amico are no longer together, that they broke up. Lawyers for her alleged co-conspirators declined to comment here, all three of them facing up to 10 years in prison if convicted. I know, Adrian, you spoke with all three of them back when things were a little bit better. No, this is when it first started. We actually booked an interview with them right after this announcement was made on GoFundMe that they were receiving up to $400,000 in donations. Thousands of people sympathizing with this story. Mm -hmm. And initially, uh, you saw uh, Bobbitt there with sunglasses on. It was because he had an eye infection. Uh, his eye was severely pained, and he was sitting and was so nervous sitting down for that interview. But he said over and over again how much he wanted to give back to other people because of what was being done for him. And both uh, of the girlfriend and the boyfriend were both saying that they too wanted to make sure that this was yeah. something that helped somebody. So it was all about donation, it was all about philanthropy, and now it seems a bit Little more bit complicated. Little did we know. Yes, yeah. we're viewing the story and through different eyes at this point. And Americans feel betrayed. People yeah. very yeah, so upset many people with were uh, generous. the well, allegations. GoFundMe yeah. is going to refund all of those all folks of them. who donated oh, wow. uh, to this cause. Uh, but again, it was just interesting looking back on it and flashing back to some of those clips and some of the conversation that we had and how much they ins insisted that this was a help to people and that they wanted to that help others major. like him. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we're going to learn more details about how it all we went down. We will. Well, a submarine that went missing last year with 44 crew members on board has been found. Argentina's Navy announcing they have found that wreckage at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Patagonia. The discovery coming just two days after loved ones held a memorial for the missing sailors who vanished exactly one year ago to the day. On a very different note, do you guys recognize this voice? Oh. Elvis Presley. The king. There it is. Yes. Uh, that is uh, one of our nation's new Medal of Freedom honorees, Elvis Presley. President Trump awarding the nation's highest civilian honor to a rather eclectic group of seven Americans, including Elvis Presley, among the other honorees, baseball legend Babe Ruth and Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the front row there making her first 
public appearance since she was hospitalized after a fall. She was there to pay tribute to her good friend, Justice Scalia. Really interesting friendship there between people who had very different ideologies. And a great moment there, too. Let's go back to Rob Marciano with a check of the forecast. Rob, you've been covering all sorts of things. Uh, it is great to see you back in the studio with us, though. It's great to be here. Uh, you can't, well, I, I was going to lie to you and tell you I was wearing my blue suede shoes and on our velvet, <laughs> but uh, that's clearly not the case. Uh, we have <laughs> some winter weather across the area. By the way, I applaud uh, Babe Ruth for getting in, in on that, too. Winter storm warnings are posted now for parts of uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. I-80, we'll look for significant snow there. Winter weather advisories do kind of stretch into parts of the Midwest with kind of a two-pronged system. Chicago, you're getting a little bit of snow this morning. Uh, light accumulations, heavier accumulations.